and welcome to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today is novelist Naomi Hirahara. Naomi, thank you so much for joining us on Zoom. Um, I, I have to say I loved your new book, Clark and Division. Um, and I, I know it's, it's different um, in many ways from the earlier books that you've written because it's in a way less a mystery, although there's a mystery in it, than a, a picture of a, a, a historical period that, that we don't often think about or get, we don't often have books that are, are, are talking about this period in such a human way. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. In a way, I feel like I'm a debut author although my first novel came out in two, 2004. Wow. And, and what, so, so your earlier novels are mysteries, uh, uh, and they're a, a series with this, you have a continuing, um, a continuing character in them. What, what inspired you to make this change to write about Japanese Americans after the internment camps were closed. What 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 made you think? Oh wow, I've got to write about that. How should I do it? Well, in a way, I think this is the fruition of. It was funny. So Hope Press they did a little write up on, on me and said that I've used my thirty five years of experience to produce this book. And I was going. 35 years, wait a minute. But then when I calculated, that's about the time that I had uh, joined the Rafu Shimpo, which is literally means Los Angeles newspaper, a, a Japanese American daily newspaper. Um, I joined in the 1980s. And the discussion there was primarily on the redress and reparations uh, movement for Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated. So that was my own family, didn't have that experience. They were in Hiroshima during World War II. So that was kind of the basis of my Gardner uh, Mysteries Masarai. That was more like my father's story. But this is really, I mean, when people look at me, they may think, oh, you're, I'm an ins a total insider to the story. But it's really um, that commitment of writing about this experience um, and covering it as a journalist um, that, that gave birth to it. And I've always been fascinated to write from a Nisei, that's a second generation Japanese American woman's point of view, because um, while I was at the newspaper, it was really hard for me to crack the veneer um, because you know they're so uh, resilient and sometimes they didn't wanna revisit kind of the struggles that they had faced. And it was really this photograph uh, taken by a woman named Marion Palfi. She had lived in New York and she was European. She had visited one of these hostels, which was kind of the way station for Japanese Americans. She had visited one in LA. And just to see the chaos and the disarray, you know, um, clothing was strewn everywhere. And then there, some things were hung on the walls and two beds were pushed together. You know, four families were in one room. And, um, you know, I had written about this with my uh, friend, Heather Lindquist, um, Life After Manzanar. So, you know, some of the facts and those things had come across. Chicago was the number one destination for people who, and by the way, my book takes, the place, takes place in 1944. So the camps were still in operation at that time, but uh, uh, the Nisei were the first to be released if they, you know, answered these questions properly. And, um, you know, so Chicago, they had 400 Japanese Americans before World War II. Suddenly, by the mid 40s, they're 20,000. Most of them are young people, they're in their 20s. And um, one of the reports that I came across said there was some delinquency in the community. So, by the mid, you know, after the war, there were groups that were trying to address some of the issues, the social issues that plagued the young Nisei. And it makes total sense, right? You, you're you ripped away from your home, you're either in a desert or swamplands, and then you're in this very notorious city of Chicago, which is the second, lar at the time, second largest city. So it makes sense that, you know, there would be, you know, uh, a stick-up man, stick man in the community 
there were babies being born out of wedlock. There was an abortion, which was illegal at that time. So, of course, for me, um, as a mystery writer, I write social histories as well as I go, hey, I've never really heard this. I want to explore it through a mystery. And, and what you've written is really a social mystery couched in a mystery format, which, which I think is so smart because I've always felt that whatever you read, you learn from. And I love learning history through fiction, knowing that it's fiction. I mean, I'm not pretending, you know, that a history of King Arthur is the facts and everything. But um, I think it's just a wonderful way to learn history um, you know, that a, a history book can tell you the facts, but a novel, a historical novel, can tell you the, tr the truth. And I think that, um, you know, that, that was, that's what makes this book, that's what's, that's what's making this book so popular, I think, you know, and, and such, good, so, such a wonderful reception for it. Well, I think the mystery genre, I think you couldn't do it in any other genre. And one reason is there's not that much information out there. This is not a topic, you know, in terms of the darker side of the experience that people really wanted to discuss in oral histories. Um, you sh and it also depended on who the historians interviewed. Sometimes you don't want to, uh, the troublemakers or people who got into some kind of trouble or controversy, sometimes they didn't want to be interviewed, right? So you more have the respectable respectable people. So I had to read between the lines to kind of say, oh, there was like this gang fight here in Chicago, you know, just lightly mentioned. So I think the genre is like perfect in pulling out the truth. And I think the people at the time were just, and um, you know, it, and it makes perfect sense. They were concentrating on um, rebuilding their lives making a better future for their children or the niece were trying to, you know, they're into romance and, you know, their friends and kind of rebuilding their lives. So a lot of, I think people didn't want to quite look back, you know, at the incarceration experience. But when there's a crime that happens, you know, my lead character, Aki, who is the younger sister, she's uh, looking into what happened to her older sister. It kind of pulls the essence, the the true dilemma that people are going through, that maybe they wouldn't really think about until decades later. But Aki, my protagonist, she doesn't have that, you know, um, advantage. She has to deal with it right then and there. Right. What? Why was Chicago such a popular destination? when when they were letting the Nisei out of the camps? Well, it was in the middle of the country, you know, so there was some, I think, military considerations. Um, it's, like I mentioned, second biggest town, a lot of factories. So this is the irony that, you know, they re the government removed Japanese Americans from the West Coast saying there was some kind of military threat, strategic threat. But then they're coming to Chicago and working in defense factories. Detroit was another popular place. So, you know, that doesn't really make total sense. But uh, yeah. And then also um, very important was the American Friends Service. The Quakers really helped Japanese Americans. And they and the government kind of targeted Chicago as the place for them to go. What has been the response of, of uh, your, your Nisei readers? Of, of the book. Um, I, I mean, I know it's just, you know, every every time I open an email from So Hope Press, I see, you know, more praise, uh, just, justifiably more praise for Clark and Division. But I, I wonder, I've been wondering, what is, what is your response from Nisei readers? Well, unfortunately, most of that generation is gone. It's gone, right. Yeah, so they're in their 80s or 90s, you know, so... Um, I'm getting more response from their children mm -hmm. um, that and who helped me immensely was um, Eric Matsunaga, who was my you know social historian of Chicago. And he took me to this intersection in Clark and Division, where uh, many people stayed not long term. It was more like a temporary like a way uh, a way station. Yes. And then they would go to different parts of Chicago. 
But many people would say, yeah, their parents never really talked to them about Clark and Division. Mm -hmm. You know, so what they, and then um, Soho does this beautiful job of maps, and I really wanted a map. And so the few times I've been able to do per, um, in person events, socially distanced safe, of course, people have like shown me, like, my parents lived here, you know, on the map. So I think, I think that's why also I felt more freedom to write about this in a fictional way, because kind of all the attempts, you know, to document this um, through nonfiction, through living people, you know, that point is passing. Right. So I, you know, that's why I felt, okay, I feel, you know, free to do this in, in this fictional manner. How, how did you start, how did you begin to, to write that original series? You know, what, what led you to that? I, you worked at the newspaper and um, so you were, <clears throat> of course, writing, but what at that point made you turn to fiction and specifically mysteries? I always wanted to be a fiction writer. You know, so um, as a journalist, we have UCLA extension. So after work, I would go take a class, you know, novel writing. So my first book, um, Summer of the Big Bachi, actually took me 15 years before it came. And I was writing about an older character, you know, and male. So I was, you know, I, I, it was still kind of what I knew because I was writing about a character like my father. So it was indeed an homage to he, it's not him, but, you know, homage to him and people like him because um, there's so many Japanese American men who became gardeners after World War II because it was hard to find a job. My dad came, he returned to America and he had some language issues, you know, he couldn't speak English that well. So gardening, uh, maintenance gardening, gardening was, you know, up north where you are too in the Pacific Northwest. That was, you know, you guys get a lot more rain than we do. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was like a viable occupation. And it was a halo effect. It, I think some people down here in L.A., they felt pride, like I have a Japanese gardener. And, um, you know, and there was so much post-war uh, housing that had been, you know, little, little homes, standalone homes, and everyone wanted their little garden. So I, you know, I really am uh, gravitate towards um, hidden stories about ordin seemingly ordinary characters. That's, you know, because that was the way I was raised. And I felt my father was, uh, you know, with his truck, he had a truck, pickup truck filled it with stuff, and then he moved into having a van. But I would think that people passing by would, you know, just ignore him or, oh, it's just another blue collar gardener. Whereas myself as a daughter, um, you know, I and my brother as well, he went with my father to help him out more than I did. But, you know, really know, uh, you know, this here's this fascinating person that had survived this, you know, watershed event of uh, uh, bombing of Hiroshima. And he was also an American citizen. So there's all these interesting contradictions. And I thought that could be explored in a mystery, kind of like um, Chester Himes, you know, Walter Mosley, a lot of African-American uh, writers kind of set the stage. And actually the way I found my um, agent was through uh, following Barbara Neely, the late Barbara Neely's um, Blanche on the Lamb series. It's like a Southern domestic. And, you know, at first when I was looking for an agent, I was going, oh, I should go after people who public, I mean, who represent people like Amy Tan, but then it, it occurred to me what I'm doing is actually more in line with someone like a Barbara uh, Neely. That's you know, it's a mystery, it's a continuing series, interesting character, and kind of a portrait of the working class. Um, so uh, yeah, so I just found, looked at the acknowledgments, and wrote to Barbara's uh, uh, representation, and you know, it, it took a while, but it eventually did happen. So. Um, I definitely tip my hat to all those writers. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things about Walter Mosley is that I, I believe um, in the Easy Rollins series that he's writing social history. I mean, there's a history of black Americans in Los Angeles um, 
from the 30s on and you you get so much from those mysteries not only a good mystery but you get that social history as well do, do you have any um any any f what do you think your next project is going to be um you know i do think that um clark and division kind of has moved me into a new stage of my writing career and i i'm very cognizant of kind of my own periods <laughs> of time and I think, uh, you know, I love mystery. It's funny that I've never written historical fiction before. There's always been a nod, you know, like with the Masarai series, it was most more like a cold case. So things were uh, set in contemporary LA or New York or wherever, but then there's something from the past that he has to dredge up. And here this, we're straight in the past. And um, so I think it's a great, intersection of my passion for history as well as the mystery genre. I may, you know, sneak, sneak in a non-mystery historical as well, but um, I am doing, this is not a ser series necessarily, but I am doing a follow-up. Oh, with Aki, a, another one with Aki, carrying her yeah. further, grow, growing up more. Yeah, and it's called um, Evergreen, and that refers to a neighborhood um, in Boyle Heights or next to a lot uh, Los, Los Angeles, downtown LA. Uh -huh. So I'll, that's all I give you. So it, it does, I don't stay in Chicago um, for a number of reasons. One is mo most people return to the West Coast, their homes anyway. And this is going to be set in 1946. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah. It was later. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not a native Chicago, you know, I think there's, I, I believe there will be some great books set in the 1950s Chicago where the um, families became more established because some did stay in Chicago. But I, I give that baton to someone else to run with it. Is, is there still, is there a large uh, Japanese American community in Chicago? It's funny, I, I, it's funny those Midwesterns, I grew up in Detroit and you know, um, I don't remember a big Japanese American community in Detroit or or Chicago. Um, because the government told them when they were to re, uh, resettle, well, first they told them don't clump in numbers that like three or more, which was ridiculous. Because and in terms of housing, how they're going to live among their own people, right? Um, because there's more connections you, you feel more safe right. with, you, um, so uh, so that's why you know there are some Buddhist temples that are in Chicago um, but in terms of a centralized concentrated place um, you know it, it kind of was erased uh -huh. you know and so that's what I'm attempting to do with a novel actually a mystery novel is to kind of be a marker of that place mm -hmm. and hopefully in the future there'll be physical markers you know that, that tell a little bit about the history and i i think that will happen there's a lot of um uh people who are preserving history by talking story and taking walking tours so you know do you find that there's a big interest among young people whose parents were nisei that this is that this period wasn't something that was talked about, um, and so there's a, a kind of hunger to learn about it. For sure, and I'm finding a lot from the fourth generation. Actually, it's kind sometimes the interest in history skips a generation, and I think it's for the people who really who didn't have. Um, the privilege, like I did, to actually talk and interview and touch and see the three-dimensional um, parts of, you know, their elders. So um, I think they're, in fact, what's happening right now is um, there's this uh, virtual pilgrimage. They usually, people usually take the pilgrimage, um, you know, physically. But now, since we can't do that, they're uh, this year virtually this whole month, you know, and in, in into September will be all this programming about like different topics, including the 10 
incarceration camps. And I'll, I'll be participating in discussion oh, with Clark yeah. and Division. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of interest. And surprisingly, it's not the children, but it's uh, there's some. But the grandchildren are the ones who are really hungry. Right. Is are there other books that that set that are that are set either fiction or, or not? I mean, you must have looked for nonfiction in this period. There is um, a, mem uh, a book by a niece, um, Monica Sone, a niece daughters that um, right. kind of actually follows the same um, geographic trajectory. Um, she takes a much sunnier view of the experience. And I guess as a crime writer and former journalist, you know, although Aki is an optimistic character, and I did that purposefully instead of doing a noir because I really wanted people to think, oh, that that reminds me of my mother, you know, my aunt, my grandmother. You know, I, I've done some very dark stories in the past where <laughs> a Nisei woman, um, you know, uh, chops up her white lover and puts it in a suitcase that was um, called the Chidashi Covenant. But, you know, I don't think people in my community resonated with that story because they couldn't imagine, um, you know, their elder actually doing, I mean, sure, you know, there, there are all sorts of people out there, but I was really trying to uh, capture more of a typical, like, you know, personality. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I wonder, you know, there's such a proliferation of noir mysteries coming out these days. Um, and, and I feel, you know, and dystopian science fiction, all this kind of stuff. I, I, if personally, I just wonder if, if an, that, that enough is enough, you know, that we're living in a dystopian noir environment, world now, uh, it seems, with climate change and, you know, everything that's going on with COVID and the Delta variant, I, I mean, it, it's a relief in many ways to me to find um, a novel like yours that isn't dystopian, that isn't a noir, where there aren't people chopping up lovers and, you know, making soup out of their bones or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to say, like, some people love that the, the, the darkness of thrillers and you know, and it's the most unexpected people, you know, it could be an older grandmother who loves that. So, yeah, I think there's a place for all those stories, but I think you have to write about who you, your own voice and my voice, um, you know, per probably personally as well as literary is not as dark in terms of a large, a, a long, like a, uh, a novel. I do it in spurts in um, short stories which is great, you know, and it could exercise a lot of demons as well as doing experimentation, you know, like uh, experimenting with different voices. But I do think, um, you know, maybe that's why some people are gravitating towards this book because it is dark what they're dealing with and what she's personally lost, but that she can somehow um, be vigilant and not um, be overcome by her situation um, I, I think, you know, uh, could inspire people, you know, especially during the pandemic when we are dealing with such unknown circumstances and we are confined, you know, in a way we are confined. And that's what Aki has been through herself. So. Mm -hmm. When you write, when you were writing Clark and Division, d did you outline uh, oh, and was the writing of it different from the mystery series? You know, it was really tough for me to get the voice of this. And my um, editor, um, Juliet Grams, who I know you've interviewed and is yeah. very lovely. You know, she put she took me to task to because the thing about Aki is she doesn't dwell all the time in her emotions. I mean, she is emotional. But she's also trying to do some investigating, you know, into this situation. And uh, so, yeah, so there's there's a certain text narr um, narrative within the book where, you know, I explain that she sometimes she doesn't know how she feels because 
it's just been since she was a child when she had to deal with, you know, not being allowed to swim in a, you know, a friend's swimming pool with white children. You know, all of this stuff is like being pushed down. You know, it's not like she, she's not feeling it, but she just has learned to survive. She can't react to every little thing that happens or else, you know, she couldn't make it in this world. So, um, so I, you know, I had to carefully, because I didn't want this book to be, oh, I want to just explain Japanese America. You know, it's, I didn't want to be this didactic thing. But on the other hand, I wanted, you know, modern day readers, maybe even the grandchildren of a niece, you know, they might have not totally understood why certain things were not talked about. So I wanted to, as organically as possible, kind of pull, pull that thread for people. Well, Naomi, I know that all of your readers, all the people who have loved Clark and Division are eagerly chomping at the bit waiting for the new book um, and then to see what direction you go in next. So um, good luck with all of that. And um, I hope we get to meet in person someday so I can tell you in person how much I loved Clark and Division. Thank you so much. And yes, most of my friends are up in the Seattle area, so we'll see each other for sure. Oh, that would be lovely. That would be great. Thank you so much for coming on Booklust. Thank you, Nancy.